now we're going to run a sort of combined session. So I think Luigi is going to just talk through some cases in which APRV is used. And Nader Abashi is here from America, and he's one of the best proponents of APRV, I think. I've heard talking ever about it. So he's going to help us sort of understand how to make use of it. And it may be a mode that encourages spontaneous ventilation to such a degree actually avoids a lot of the problems that we've just heard about with regard to asynchrony. So, um, so what we thought we'll do the next few minutes is basically I will be the, I think the junior doctor um, sort of um, faced with some clinical cases and I'm going to do something, I'll present the case, present some concept, then present the case and then ask my expert to explain it to me. So, and then you've got the opportunity to ask questions. So it's a bit of an interactive, but we'll do it that way. And hopefully the cases might illustrate some points about the principle of a PRV and some troubleshooting. So I hope it works for you. So, so I think this is what we're going to do, but we're not going to do it in succession, but we're doing it all together. So this is where we've discussed about this particular slide in relation to the type of ARDS. And the one we're going to talk about is APRV. And we can see there that traditionally we've used APRV from moderate to severe ARDS. But obviously there is an argument to use um, APRV at a much earlier state um, and stage of ARDS or respiratory failure. So what is it? I think if I'm uh, as a junior doctor, I'd like a definition, because I, I, I'd like something to discuss. And I think this is what uh, might look like. So it's CPAP, effectively, uh, which we call P-high. And there is a time cycle release phase <coughs> at a lower pressure, which is P-low, and where integrated spontaneous breathing can happen throughout the, the respiratory cycle and independent from the respiratory cycle. And this is my poor attempt of PowerPoint at drawing a what a, a waveform might look like, but you can see the flow curve at the top. Uh, so this is the, the uh, release phase, and this is the spontaneous part, which is eff effectively similar to CPAP. And this is the what you will see in a, a ventilator. So you will have some settings like P high, uh, a time at a high pressure, a pressure low, a time at low pressure. And some ventilators, not all of them, will give you the opportunity to add pressure support, but we don't. Uh, and we'll go, through, we'll go through step by step to that. Uh, just this is to give you an overview. And roughly, there is an idea that proportion of time spent during the time high versus the time spent at T low. So we know that the determinant of oxygenation, I'm not going to go through, but there are lots of things that we know already. We know about FiO2, the pulmonary blood flow is very important. The lung volume is very important, but I think sometimes at the bedside, I always forget about the time, what time is required to do some, um, to recruit the lung at high pressure. The question is, we, one of the things about um, APRV is that we use what people might say they have very high pressure for a prolonged period of time. And we forget sometimes that not all pressures are equal. So if you look at this physiological study, this is looking at the same type of pressure, the same type of strain that the lung receives, but it can be delivered either as a continuous or static pressure, or as a, as a dynamic pressure. And you can see here that when you start at uh, uh, um, dynamic pressure, here this is the beginning of the uh, airway pressure, 27, and goes up to 46, so the patient normally deteriorates, the transpulmonary pressure increases, the oxygenation decreases. So the lung becomes heavier, becomes full of edema, and this is difficult. But if you use the same type of pressure with the same type of stress and strain of the lung, but delivered continuously, now here we have the reverse. We have that the pressure goes down over time, the lung compliance improves, the state of the lung improves, the lung becomes more homogeneous, the transpulmonary pressure that you need goes down, and the oxygenation either improves or remains the same. And this is one slide from 
Professor Abashi and Pen Penny Andrews here that basically shows this is one of the lungs in APRV. This is a lung on conventional ventilation. And these are the histologies. Now, I'm not a histologist here, but if this is a normal lung and this is what the APRV looks like, I'd rather have this one than this one that is in conventional mechanical ventilation. So you see much more lung injury over there. So we start with a case. So enough about the introduction. So I think this is the lady that I present in the first uh, talk. So this is a 23-year-old with asthma, unwell for three days, intubated, and then rapidly on 100%, on well, 80% oxygen, and it's got a plateau of 31 over 15 and deteriorating. Do you remember that set chest x-ray? It hasn't changed. And that's what it is on basically day one post-intubation. So what do you think happens to that lady? Clue is in the title of the presentation. Uh, obviously, she goes onto APRV, uh, gets recruited on APRV, and you can see that in the next few hours, she goes, if you follow here, this is a, a screenshot of the um, electronic patient system, and you can see here, this is the modality of ventilation, and here you've got the gases, and you can see we start at 80%. By the time we, after a few hours, she's already on 50 and goes down after a few days, you can see here, this is 24, 48, three days, four days, goes down to 24, 28% oxygen with better gases. CO2 is cleared, but we've got an issue with the main airway pressure. Main, mean airway pressure is 25, 23 to start with, and then we start weaning. Now, if we had to do a ARDS classification here, you can see the PF ratio goes from 10. Would you agree this will classify as a severe ARDS? So uh, up to 19, 22, 36, and basically up to 42. So she goes within three days across the entire severity of ARDS based on PF ratio from severe to moderate to mild. And technically, at day three, she's no longer an ARDS if we don't take into account the, the mean airway pressure, so the oxygenation index or the work that is required to maintain that PF ratio. And this is eight days later. Obviously, she had a very uh, uh, disease responsive to treatment. She's done very well. But that's the concept of clearing edema and recruitment over time. So that lady was clearly recruited in the referring hospital, but obviously she needed that amount of time and that amount of pressure to fully recruit the airways. I'm going to present another case. Um, I think most of my colleagues here will recognize. Uh, uh, obviously, he's a 62-year-old gentleman, had a kidney pancreas transplant, referred from another hospital, very high oxygen and pressures. The stories will be very similar uh, in terms of oxygenation and pressures, and a PO2 of 8. So you would agree that he's a sort of type of severe ARDS. That looks like this chest X-ray, so bilateral infiltrates. Uh, this was on May, 26th of May, the day of referral. And that was his recruitment CT. So that has a five centimeters of water and 45. And you will agree that there is minor recruitment at within 40 seconds of, uh, of high pressure. But again, after a few hours, and uh, uh, he improves and clearly responds fairly quickly to APIV in terms of oxygenation index. And you can see here that from 13, goes up to 42. So these are patients where um, colleagues have been struggling for ventilation. And this is a patient very severe and clearly need to be in a place where, if necessary, it could go into extracorporeal uh, circulation. But that's his chest X-ray at day two, uh, but very high pressure, well, high pressures on APRV. And you can see there uh, that you can think, right, those were pulmonary edema, bilateral infiltrates, but what about the lobe pneumonias? What about the patients with the unilateral disease? Well, I'm going to show this case. It's a lady who had a right-side Legionella pneumonia, multiple organ failure, and you can see again uh, your going from APRV there with um, uh, that mean airway pressure, and you start with 75% and very rapidly improves over time. And by over time, I mean over the last four, three, four days.
And this was her chest X-ray. So you can see it's fairly unilateral disease. So it's not the classical diffuse bilateral pulmonary edema or infective pulmonary edema. And this is a few days later, it starts to clear and then cl <coughs> and clears again. Uh, and obviously that will track the improvement in gas exchange. So now this is my, as a junior doctor, that's my limit, the comfort of my knowledge. So I'm going to ask, the question is, we've looked at the fact that some of these patients after 40 seconds between five and 45 centimeters of water show very little recruitment. But then after three days on APRV, there is massive lung recruitment. And so the question is, what is the effect of pressure time versus pressure alone? And then what is the effect of uh, APRV on pulmonary edema? So I'd like to ask some help. I don't know the full answer here. I can only speculate on what we see in the lab. And even some older data that suggests that if you add a continuous pressure, we can call it PEEP or you can call it CPAP, that you may actually encourage water redistribution into the interstitial space and actually improve the lymphatic flow. The key thing, though, is that when you have a continuous pressure like PEEP, one of the key differences, and this is speculation, is that the lymphatics may not uh, dilate. And one of the, the problems is that if you move the water to the interstitial space, you still need to get it out of the tissue. And what we found in APRV is that the lymphatics are very dilated. And despite uh, lots of fluid resuscitation, whether it's our patients or animal models, it, the lung water stays very low when we measure this by PICO, where it tends to go up in other modes. So it may have something to do, I'm speculating here, with the release phase. That when you add pressure to the chest, you're actually pushing the, the water into the interstitial space where lymphatics are, but the release of the pressure, because the problem is the outflow pressure to the thoracic duct and to the innominate vein are going to be the same. So there's no flow. There's no pressure gradient. But that intermittent release may cause a slight change in pleural pressure where you actually create a peristaltic pump because the, the lymphatic vessels are valved. So the dilation plus the release may lead to that. Again, I don't know that that's the mechanism. That's something we're trying to study. But we definitely feel that there's a lung water protection going on because the, the edema in APRV is not in the distal airspace. It is in the interstitium of the lung, whereas in, in other modes of ventilation, it tends to be everywhere and actually much less in the interstitial. We have a lot of bronchial cuffing and lots of water around the, the, the lymphatics. Thank you very much. And then, Penny, you want to Okay, yeah, uh, so a couple of things. Um, I think one, one thing that when we talk about using high airway pressures on APRV, I think it's also important to look at it as mean airway pressure because, as Dr. Obashi has often described, what's the mean airway pressure of, of the waveform this way or this way? So the mean airway pressure versus driving the pressure in for a short period of time or holding the pressure for a long period of time. So this is from the lab uh, that we collaborate with in Syracuse. And on the um, left side, you'll see a homogeneous lung. This is a normal lung. We take that, and you can see the alveoli barely move. So the gas is diffused um, across the membrane. So there's diffusive gas exchange. Now we injure the lung, and you see on the right, there's um, a lot of collapse a lot of uh, heterogeneity, and so the lung, the, this is in vivo microscopy, so you can see that the lung is very damaged. So then if you go to the next slide, we see this is now we're going to try to recover the lung, and this is low tidal volume strategy. And you can see where the volume is distributed, and it's still very heterogeneous. And you can see there's still a lot of collapse, and you have to keep increasing PEEP to try to um, uh, stabilize that lung. Versus if we go to the next slide, um, we now recover this same injured lung with APRV. And you can see, as Dr. Bashi was describing, the release is very brief. And so the pressure is held for a longer period of time. As uh, um, Dr. Camperata explained, the 90% versus the 10% on the release. So you recover the um, homogeneity. Thank you. And this is the slide that you were mentioning the, about yes. the lymphatics. <clears throat> okay. Do you not think the spontaneous breathing component as well helps the lymphatic pump? pump? 
I, I think probably yes. Uh, the studies that we were talking about, there was no spontaneous breathing. Okay. I think that's a spontaneous breathing is just a whole other dimension, and perhaps we'll touch on that. But. Did you want to mention about anything? Sure, about we, we, can, we can do this. Now, this is one of the proposed studies we're going to try to do, but if you look at this, this perhaps work, you can see that what this is describing is whatever type of edema you have in the lung, as you develop interstitial expansion, you will at some point create a change in the compliance of the interstitium. So normally the interstitium of the lung is very, has very low compliance. And then at some point the compliance becomes very high. And it's almost as though there's sort of a, a, a separation, a, a dissection of the tissue and you actually tear the interstitium of the lung, which is the supporting structure of the lung, the matrix of the lung. And so you can actually detect these proteoglycans before there's actually gas exchange abnormalities. And perhaps what we're doing with EPRV is sort of sandwiching things by holding the pressure. And again, I sometimes use the analogy of if you have hemorrhage, you want to hold the, the bleeding artery. You don't want to do this for a brief period of time. It's not as effective as if you hold it. Maybe you do this very briefly, but perhaps uh, water would tamponade in a similar fashion. Uh, that's sort of a, a very basic concept, but uh, you know, essentially that may be what's going on here. <clears throat> There's a question over there. Uh, it's very interesting. Both, both of those things sound a lot like what we were trying to do with high frequency yes. respiratory ventilation. Yes. So where does that go? Where does it go wrong in HFO? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that either. I can only speculate. I, I think there's a lot of similarities, but there's some key differences. And I think one of the key differences is the ventilation is, is done with a release phase rather than actually not really moving the lung entirely or just very briefly moving it. That may have something to do with the way water moves. It's possible. Um, but, you know, probably I feel the most important concept is that because APRV is really CPAP, and you know, a lot of times you can think of APRV as, let me take a normal inverse rate, a normal inspiratory time, and I keep adding it. And if you think of that way, you think, oh, this is inverse ratio. Well, you can erase that and think of it as just CPAP. And now what you're going to do is just briefly interrupt it. It just feels differently if you come from it the CPAP way. So what that really means is that CPAP is a mode that is as simple as it gets. There's no trigger. There's no complication, really, of having to, to deal with anything. So basically, you can apply this early. And my overall feeling is the, the key thing is to prevent further heterogeneity. And I feel many of our patients, even if they come in with normal lungs, it's not very long until we actually produce this heterogeneity because we sedate them, we put them flat on their back, we take them to the operating theater, we, we do lots of things that produ produces uh, this heterogeneity of the lung, which produces an abnormal stress-strain relationship in the parenchyma. And I believe that uh, there's injury here. In fact, we just published a paper last week in intensive care medicine, and the title of the paper is Occult Ventilator-Induced Lung Injury. And what we were able to do is just simply show that when you take the PEEP up, after you produce alveolar instability, same sort of mechanism, that the PO2 goes up in a linear fashion as you increase PEEP. The alveolar stability does not, and it actually plateaus, and it's really hard to regain alveolar stability. So what we commonly use is PO2, thinking that the lung is okay, but you have x-ray abnormalities. You have a lot of other subtle clues that perhaps the distribution of ventilation is altered, that the relationship of how gas is distributed in the lung. I think that's also a key question, of course, is you know, the low tidal volume concept, in, in my view, sometimes is an incomplete thought simply because we don't know what's happening on the other side. We don't have a good visual representation of how this is distributed. Analogous to high cardiac output, you know, where is that going? I mean, high cardiac output doesn't mean you're going to survive your sepsis. It's how it distributes and how well your microcirculation. Which was shown in that video where the 6 mLs per kg was going, which, and you could see on that video it was just going into a very small portion where the rest of the lung was neglected. I want to show this case because it's not everything is about pulmonary edema. It's not everything is about uh, patients getting rapidly better miraculously. So this is a lady uh, who, uh, again, was referred from a different hospital, came in with abdominal sepsis, had a Hartman's procedure, and then postoperatively she developed uh, atrial fibrillation. 
that's very common. She was treated with the amiodarone, again very common. But then she developed progressive respiratory failure. And you can see here the time scale from the 11th of February, and then she was referred um, 20 days later um, because at this point she had progressive respiratory failure. And she was, that's the diagnosis. She had an acute interstitial lung disease, possibly secondary to amiodarone. She was treated with methylprednisolone. So this is what the chest X-ray looked like from the 10th when she had post-op, and then the 22nd when she was referred. So you can see progressive deterioration. And then she was on APRV. This is what was with us. And you can see that whatever pulmonary edema there was, that cleared. But the chest X-ray is not normal. And you can see that it's not normal because she develops a left side pneumothorax and she has a chest strain. And here you may not be able to see it, but she develops a right side pneumothorax as well. But the reason is there is this pattern of CT scan. You, you would agree with me that there is a lot of interstitial lung disease, a lot of ground glass there, and this is not a reversible. So the part that we've been able to reverse has been the, the consolidation in the edema. So you can see there the consolidation has been um, impro uh, sort of improved. You can see here there is a lot of heterogeneity, which is not clearly there. The lung edema is cleared, but there is a lot of underlying fibrotic lung disease. And you can see here from the trend of the FIO2 that this is a lady that despite several days of treatment, she has not responded. This is a lady where uh, obviously she has irreversible uh, fibrotic lung disease, not responded to conventional ventilation, not responded to methylprednisolone. So that's not a happy end ending, but just illustrates the point of what he can be achieved. And that's the point of the length of lung injury before we treat with APRV and the length of treatment before someone develops uh, irreversible and uh, fibrotic lung disease. So I was just going to say something about goals, if it's OK. So I think the goals that we want to achieve is to recruit and maintain the lung volume. We'll do that using a, a time pressure product, so the, the high pressure, uh, uh, high sort of a longer period of time. And what we want to do is decrease the elastic work of breathing, and that's we can achieve that with higher, slightly higher pressure, and goes back to the question that uh, Luis just mentioned earlier on. And we would like to minimize the number of releases because obviously any, uh, every time we release the lung, we'll create some, some sort of uh, recruitment, de-recruitment. There is a specific way to set the T-low, so we minimize the deflation of the lung. And then I just say here, allow spontaneous breathing as soon as feasible. I'm not really committing myself to say exactly when, but I think when the patient is ready. I, in other words, when the patient is improving. <laughs> And the re reason why we're ready is that we need to see some improvement in lung volume. I can't tell you two, two days, three days, but clearly it's not feasible to start spontaneous breathing in someone who is really struggling with the high driving pressure. OK, so we've got some guidance. Uh, this is really um, very general guidance. Um, but if we think about T-high, we would like it to be between 4 and 6. But this is just a beginning, a starting uh, um, point. And we can do it shorter if there is no spontaneous breathing and if we are concerned about the CO2. Certainly, we want to beginning a little bit more bulk ventilation if the CO2 is high. and. Um, if the diffusing capacity is low, so for example, lung fibrotic or any condition that causes poor recruitment. And maybe we can go a little bit longer if there is spontaneous breathing, if the CO2 is normal with mandatory ventilation and again, good diffusion and certainly during weaning, whether we can extend well, be well beyond that, uh, that time. The P high is a very difficult thing, and this is going to be expert question, but I'll tell you what I've experienced in two of the two patients. Uh, this is uh, P high, so normally it's between 25 and 35, but this is really rule of thumb. We can set it based on the same plateau peak pressure, depending on what modality of ventilation you use. You can use the oxygenation index, and I'm going to explain a little bit how well going to show you the importance of it, we can be a little bit more sophisticated looking at esophageal pressure, but that's not, certainly not routine and is something that might not be recommended all the time. And I just note here that P high greater than 35 sometimes may be 
uh, required. And when the PHI is very elevated, we need to think about um, non-compliant um, vent ventilator circuits because some of the energy will be dispersed by the tubing. So this is the concept of oxygenation index. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but just to remind ourselves, because there will be a little, a little case at the very end of the presentation. So essentially, this is the inverse of a PF ratio, but it's corrected for the mean airway pressure. So here, the higher the oxygenation index, the worse is the lung, regardless of the PF ratio. So in other words, if the mean airway pressure or the PH is 25 uh, and the PF ratio is eight, is a very different from some one with a PF ratio of 8, but the mean air pressure of 10. So that takes into consideration the effort or the pressure cost to maintain that uh, FiO2. That is an idea of, of um, um, esophageal pressure. So you can see here, this is the esophageal, and this is during APRV. And why do we do that sometimes? Sometimes we don't know whether what we are doing with the ventilator will translate and be transmitted straight to the lung. You can see here that the transpulmonary pressure here is only 10 centimeters of water, but obviously the pH is 28 over zero. And it is it's quite useful to see that you're not transmitting all that pressure to the lung. So, uh, uh, will be next. And this is compare and contrast with a positive pressure ventilation, so a normal pressure control ventilation. And this is one of the problems sometimes that we can do during um, setting the pressure high in spontaneously breathing patient. So you can see here, this is a quite large swing, and then possibly here the PH is set too low. So the patient needs bigger swings over there, and when the pressure is optimized, obviously the pressure swings become much smaller because the patient is uh, at the optimal lung volume. So I've got a case. It's a 60-year-old gentleman with a lot of uh, comorbidities, uh, very breathless, um, admitted on, in January this year first with the non-invasive ventilation, then failed, intubated the next day, 100% oxygen, and referred to us for refractory hypoxemia. That was his chest X-ray. But the important thing I want to show you is this. Um, you can agree with me that the shape is uh, towards, you know, will point towards a very high pleural pressure or intra-abdominal pressure. And in that case, the gentleman was started on APRV, and two days later, that was his chest X-ray. But um, second, second lady, it's a 55-year-old lady with schizophrenia. She came to different hospital with um, drowsiness. Respiratory symptoms treated with antibiotics by GP and then hypoxemic was intubated and then referred to us because of uh, respiratory failure. And she came to us on the 21st of January. I don't know what you think, but I can't make too much of this chest X-ray. It's all very sort of white, bilateral, uh, difficult to see where the diaphragms uh, are. And that's a, a body shape. Um, and in that case, you can see how here you've got a lung that is completely collapsed, and I think this is just, um, I cropped a little bit to say that it's a small lung around a, a quite heavy chest. And this is reflected a little bit on the P high. So you can see here the P high is 38, 39, uh, but you can see this allowed us to go from a PO2 of 8 down to a PO2 of 60% within a few hours. And then this is something that uh, uh, Penny has given me very nice. And just what the feeling of uh, a high pleural pressure must be on a ventilating patient. So the idea that the P high should lift all this weight. And the question is, is P high, when is P high not high enough? And how high can we go? So, so this is the, what we will see, uh, and this is one of the things I would like to ask. But I'd like also to ask you to think about this. We're talking about low, low tidal volumes. Now look at that. The peak pressure has been 45, 40, uh, with a mean about 30. But look at this expiratory volume. We've got 600, 800, 900. How many people are concerned about this tidal ventilation or release volumes? At least one. That's very good. 
Okay, so the questions I'm going to ask is about, one is about the P high, how much should we do it in mandatory or spontaneous breathing, and should we, should we be concerned about these tidal volumes or release volumes? So, thank you very much. We'll see. Okay, so, so I think that's a, a great point that, that you made about uh, considering the transpulmonary pressure, because, again, although uh, attractive, the universality of using one number, such as a plateau pressure, to fit all of our patients, which their phenotype is completely different, uh, may not make a lot of sense. And I think to some degree you have to consider the type of patient you're ventilating. I think if there's any question you have the opportunity to use uh, esophageal measuring, you should. Uh, but you certainly don't need that to, to suppose that this patient would require a lot of pressure. Now, this is, a, I think, the slide you're showing here. This is a recent study. We presented this at the Society of Critical Care Medicine in abstract form, and it's submitted for publication now. Uh, but what we did is we looked at uh, using esophageal pressure measure, and this is not spontaneously breathing. This is in the lab. And what you can see is that the transpulmonary pressure between low tidal volume and APRV are exactly the same. The difference is the chest wall component. And it is our thought that perhaps APRV is actually really good at recruiting your chest wall, especially in a, in a situation with increased chest wall elastins. So perhaps what, what's happening is the chest is getting bigger and the lung is having a little bit more room inside the thorax and uh, not actually driving direct pressure up into the lung. The difference between these two is that the mean airway pressure, sorry, the, the, P, the plateau pressure, it's called plateau, mean value uh, is around 35 and here it's 21. So the airway pressure is definitely different, uh, but there's, a, there's no change in the pressure in the lung itself. So just for clarity, that one is the, your transpulmonary pressure. Yes, you see sorry. That? And then here you've got the total pressure. Yeah. And the majority of the difference is the plural, so the chest wall. So when you when you look at the compartments, the most of the energy is actually going to the chest wall. Sorry, the same thing. I'm from the pediatric side, so we use yes. some maybe we don't use very frequently, but we use almost one of the child. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. My experience is completely the opposite that we get calls on babies that aren't doing well on high frequency and we switch them over to APRV and they do better. My guess is it's, I'm probably not as good as eight on HFOV as I am with APRV and perhaps vice versa. I think it really depends on your experience level. We've been very successful with, with uh, you know, small babies, including micropremies with APRV. I so, so, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's some key things, especially uh, the settings are even more um, important uh, and the device you use might be more important in those small babies. Yeah, and I think just real quickly, which is, um, I just wanted to make one thing clear. The time that uh, uh, Dr. Camperata showed is for adults, that four to six second range. But for pediatrics, somewhere in two, the two to three second range, and neonates one to two. And I think that's the big difference is the calculation of uh, achieving at least a 90% CPAP cycle time at the P high, T high. And I think that's very important, not, you know, not only for recruitment, for, but for the diffusive gas exchange. Also, the T low is extremely important because right. if it's not set correctly, then you may have larger tidal volumes seen at the ventilator, and it's actually analogous to decreasing your PEEP if it's set too long. So those things are very important. So the, the second issue was... The second issue, yes. Am I concerned about this 900 milliliters yes, tidal yes. volume? And well, I, I think I, I think we all feel that um, you know having dynamic def deformation of the lung is probably bad, especially with heterogeneity. And I think that's really important. It's not balloon-like distension, and I think that that's a, a key concept. The lung just doesn't behave as a simple balloon. It's just the wrong geometry for for the actual lung. And so I think what might be important is what's happening at the alveolar level. And when we look at APRV, this is APRV set incorrectly down here. This is the, the how long the release time is allowed to extend this uh, peak expiratory flow, 10%. So this is almost going to zero. So your expiratory flow is almost going all the way to, to zero. 75, you're not letting it go. It's very brief. So longer time, shorter time. And you can see that when we compare whole lung tidal volume to alveolar tidal volume, the, the alveolar volume in APRV is actually very low. 
you may get a very large tidal volume. And I don't know if you recall this, the video you showed mm -hmm. where the lung was just twitching. The, the, that was 12 mLs per kg. That little twitch was 12 mLs per kg. So if you have a, many more alveoli, each very, contributing a very small amount, you may get a large whole lung tidal volume, but what's happening in the lung is really not a lot of dynamic change, and I think that's important. If you go to low tidal volume, you see the opposite. At five of PEEP, the, the alveolar tidal volume is actually huge relative to the tidal volume. Again, this is all 6 ml. That dashed line is 6 mLs per kg tidal volume, but you're increasing the PEEP here, and what you're seeing is the actual alveolar tidal volume progressively goes down. But it's the, and of course, when you think about stress strain, strain is a deformational change. So the greater the deformational change, which is what you're seeing here at the alveolar level, that's, that's more injurious, is that high strain. So I, I don't know that we're exactly clear on, you know, I mean, low tidal volume, let's say it is protective, absolutely. And the question is, is it low tidal volume on the ventilator enough, or is it low tidal volume in the alveoli? Is that what we're really after? Mm -hmm. And uh, we call this just, you know, the microventilatory environment versus the macroventilatory. And I use the analogy of shock resuscitation. I think it's the microcirculation that we care about, not is the blood pressure okay and the cardiac output okay. Your patient may still die if they have no perfusion. And so perhaps in ventilation, we're still at that same concept that we need to extend beyond the ventilator with whatever technique. You know, there, I, think there's, I think this morning's session was good because we, we discussed a bunch of other opportunities, even stuff that's available right now to explore a greater understanding of what's actually happening rather than just tidal volume in, tidal volume mm. out. Did you want to say anything about this? This is just the stress strain. And again, you can see that the micro strain which is the green line, uh, the lighter green, is lower in APRV than in any other setting. And if you look at the macro strain, low tidal volume here, and 5 of PEEP, which is very common, it looks as though the macro strain is very low, but the micro strain is actually very high in terms of deformational change. OK, so can we do something together? So this is a, um, an imaginary patient. It's got this uh, type of um, settings there. It's got a P high of 25, T high of 5 seconds, P low of 0, and a T low of 0.5, which is 60% of the peak expiratory flow. And now this patient desaturates, or the PO2 goes down. And uh, we need to do something about it. And I would like some ideas, because I'm not sure which button to press. And I need some guidance from you. What would you like me to do? Piece PO2 is down. What's the CO2? CO2 is normal. Take it from me. <laughs> OK, we increase the P high. And we can increase the T high. I think, I think as a sort of general idea, what we want to do is increase the time pressure index. So we can do it this way. Or uh, clearly, the other option is that this release is clearly too long. So we need to shorten this release time, the T low, so we can achieve 75%. So then we, ha we have a better homogeneous lung, much more recruitment, and the, CO2, uh, the PO2 will go up. Obviously, if you have a pressure support, it's always zero. We don't want any inspiratory synchronization that can cause lung injury. That's we always use it to zero. And if you do have an ATC, we would like to decrease the friction, the resistance as much as possible. So we set it to 100%. So, um, so that, that's one of the things about the t -low. The t -low, we need release time to maintain the end expiratory lung volume, and the only thing we need is look at the expiratory flow pattern. And I'm just, I know that we shouldn't look at balloons, but for the moment, let's think about lungs like balloons. So, so if you think about a balloon that goes fully inflated and fully deflated, and this is the expiratory phase, there will be one point where there'll be the optimal end expiratory lung volume. And this point is the time 
that it takes for the expiratory flow to reach 75% of the peak expiratory flow. And this might be any number, uh, depending on the characteristic of the lung. So I'm just going to explain a little bit what I just this uh, this is my diagrammatic uh, um, uh, drawings. So if you think about a very stiff lung here on the right-hand side, then what you have is a very steep um, expiration. So the lung, to reach 75%, it will use very little time. Do you agree? Very stiff, very high elastance. And if you look at the other side, COPD or emphysema, this might take a much longer time. So here the T-low might be different, but the result, the end expiratory lung volume is the same because it will, it will equilibrate at the same time constant, so 75% of the peak expiratory time. And then just um, a little video to show how we calculate it. And it's very simple. It's basically you freeze the screen, you go back, you look at the peak expiratory flow, and then <clears throat> um, let's pretend it's minus 100, just for simplicity. And then you basically want to set the T low at the point where this is minus 75. So the thing is that when you do an expiratory hold there, um, obviously you can calculate the static inspiratory pressure that you generate by the T low. The T low of 0.5, let's say, in this patient has generated an intrinsic peak of 20. And if we release a little bit longer the T low, Obviously, we lose that pressure, and if we can do it long enough, the lung will deflate. So we need to make sure that the, the, the time low is always 75% to maintain the end expiratory lung volume. And this is one example where this patient here, over time, starts increasing the CO2. And you can see here the, the, was, uh, the T high was four seconds, the T low 0.4 of a second. What was clearly too short for this patient was getting a little bit better. And now what had to be done is to increase the T low and the CO2 cleared. So you've got more time because this patient was overinflating and you can see that over time over there. So basically what we're going to do if we, if we find ourselves with the same situation but where the CO2 goes up, we want to increase the P high and the T high. This is counterintuitive, but what we want to do, we want to increase the surface area and the lung volume to increase alveolar uh, ventilation. And if we can't increase diffusion because the lung is diffusion restricted, then we need to increase bulk ventilation. But this is very much lower into the uh, idea. But sometimes it's not at all about pressure. What do you think this problem, this patient is? This is a gentleman who was um, doing very well, and then the CO2 goes up all of a sudden. What do you think is wrong with this uh, patient? You're yeah, not allowed to answer. <laughs> no, but you can answer. <laughs> Certainly spontaneously breathing, but what else do you think? You see this, this is not quite a 45% slope. This patient has secretions in the tube and he's absolutely blocked his tube. So in this case, you can see all this uh, section here. In this case, a suction of the tube will solve this issue and will improve the CO2. So the question is, how do I identify and troubleshoot obstructions? And how can APRV facilitate secretion clearance? Uh, Penny and would you like to answer those two questions for us? Yes. So one of the questions of um, identifying the, um, there's factors, several factors that influence uh, peak expiratory flow rate, and one of the things that Dr. Camperata just mentioned was the um, angle. So if you come in, if you uh, leave and your peak expiratory flow rate is, let's say, 80 liters, you go to lunch and you come back and it's 40 liters now, and the angle is flat, they didn't just um, uh, develop uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that it's more than likely some type of secretion or something that's affecting the intratracheal tube, the artificial airway for the gas flow to come out. So these are examples. Um, if you can see that uh, the previous one, the peak expiratory flow rate was about um, uh, 40 liters, and we transitioned over from pressure control 4 to 1 over to APRV. And you can see here that the angle is flat. It's flat across the bottom. There's no, uh, so your peak expiratory flow rate, your termination is 100%. There's absolutely no decay whatsoever. So um, they let us know that something was wrong, asked her to suction the patient, and now you can see not 
only did the angle change to a 45 degree angle, but the peak expiratory flow rate, if you look on the next slide, um, uh, there's a comparison, um, uh, all three of them, you can see that the peak expiratory flow rate nearly doubles from that of pressure control four to one over to APRV. So it's very important to look at the peak expiratory flow rate. And if that decreases, that more than likely something is obstructing the airway.